I'm uh, Jonathan Newman. I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much uh, to the OSU Free Enterprise Society for inviting me. Uh, if you look at the uh, title of my talk and the, uh, the flyer that went with it, it would be uh, pretty funny if I came up here and said that the Fed is just okay. <laughs> it's not that big of a deal. It's, it's fine. Uh, I, I think the, the flyer is great because it's got this fiery background with the pile of cash in front, so good job with the flyer. The only addition that I would make is some, uh, some meme magic here, just at the fiery Elmo. But the, the topic is how the Fed disrupts and corrupts society. And I want to start by defining some terms. We'll define what society is and we'll define what the Fed is and, and what it does. Um, and then we'll talk through the different ways that it disrupts and uh, corrupts society. So the way that I like to talk about society is uh, by starting with a ham sandwich. So uh, just by show of hands, who has read uh, I Pencil by Leonard Reed? Anybody? Okay, a few of you. Good. So that means what I'm about to show you is new for most of you. So I want us to uh, go through this thought experiment where uh, you are going into a deli, you're hungry for a ham sandwich, you're, uh, you're hungry for it, and you're ready to order it, and you go up to the counter and you ask the person behind the deli to make it for you. I want us to go through the, a thought experiment in which we just think about all of the things that have to happen for that, san that ham sandwich to be produced for you, right, right then and there when you're hungry for it. So, and we could do a little bit of uh, outsourcing here. So what are some things that, that go into the construction of a ham sandwich immediately? So what sort of things have to be there for the ham sandwich to be put together? Yes, very good. Ham and bread <laughs> are necessary for making a ham sandwich. It wouldn't be a sandwich without bread. It wouldn't be a ham sandwich without ham. What else? Labor, yes. Ketchup, condiments. I don't know about ketchup on a ham sandwich, though. <laughs> some mustard and mayo, some lettuce. So yeah, these are all sorts of things that would go, in, go into the production of the ham sandwich. How many of you would like to just be handed the ham sandwich by the person who's making the, the sandwich? It's like, no, you would, you would prefer for it to be put on a plate or maybe wrapped in something. And you would not like to just eat it there at the counter. You'd like to go sit at a, at a table in a chair to, to consume it. So these, sort, these are also things that have to be there in order for you to, to go through the act of consuming the ham sandwich. And somebody did uh, mention it. You also have to have labor there. You have to have a person there who is earning a wage, who is willing to, to go through these steps for you of just putting together these ingredients to make the ham sandwich. But also the, the deli itself occupies some space, right? In, in economics, we call that land. So the, the space that the, the deli takes up, uh, we call land. So we need land, labor, and capital. We need, we need some factors of production here to, to make this ham sandwich. Okay, are we done with this thought experiment? Are we done? Have we, have we explained where the ham sandwich comes from if we just list out these ingredients and lands and labor along with it? The answer is no, because all of these other things... All of these things that we've listed also have, have to be explained. We have to say where the ham comes from, where the bread comes from, and so on. So where does the ham come from? Probably a butcher. The bread comes from a bakery. Lettuce comes from farming. There's probably some intermediary steps as well, but uh, we're giving an abbreviated version here. The tomato also comes from farming. Whatever's inside of mayonnaise also comes from farming. Uh... One thing that's inside of mayonnaise is, is eggs, and so that we'd have to get from a chicken farm. If it's a paper plate, then it would have to be supplied by at least the operations of a paper mill. The table and chairs it, uh, was probably produced at a furniture manufacturer. And then we can keep going around the circle. And as we, as we branch away from the ham sandwich, you'll notice that uh, there are some repeat offenders. There are some, some things that appear... Uh, way more often than the others. And two of those things are land and labor. So land and labor are required at every single step of the production process. So the butcher, it's the shop, but also it's the name for the laborer there. Uh, but the, the butcher also requires some land. Because, and hopefully it's not the same space as where the uh, sandwich is being put together in the deli. And at the butcher, you need capital, like a refrigerator, some knives to cut up the raw ingredients and turn it into a sliced deli ham. At the bakery, you need some land and labor, and you need an oven to convert the flour and other ingredients into bread. 
the flour comes from farming. So now we're seeing some interconnectedness here in, the, in this uh, structure of production for a ham sandwich. The farm requires land and labor. The farm has some fencing. I think you see where this is going, right? <laughs> we can speed this up, right? So what I'm getting at here is this very complex structure of production where we have a bunch of people who are working together. They're all cooperating to produce these capital goods, and it's all directed towards the production of a ham sandwich. And even this very complex schematic here is, is abbreviated. So like we, we're just sort of touching the high points of what it takes to make a ham sandwich. But if we were to take it to its full conclusion here, if we were to be very detailed, we'd probably get something that looks like this. I did not put this together. It's just a, I just did a Google image search for complex, and this came up or something. But the idea is that the, the way that we interact with each other in our economy, the way that our society is set up is, is very complex and requires a lot of moving parts. And uh, by the way, I go through this exercise with my students on, on the first day of class sometimes. And I see that they're all trying to like keep track. They're all trying to take notes. And a lot of times their notebook paper just looks like this. It just turns into a scribble. They, they didn't realize that the point is not to get every single, every single bit down, every single node down, but the, but the key takeaways. And the key takeaways are, as I said, production is very complex. It, uh, it takes time. So to, we can't just go immediately from a chicken farm to a ham sandwich. We can't just go from a refrigerator to the ham sandwich. But these steps, these stages in the production process take time, and they're in sequence. Um, production requires the use of real resources. So we talked about the factors of production. So there was land, labor, and everything else was capital goods with one exception. What was the exception? Land, labor, capital goods, which includes all of the tools and machines and intermediate products. But there's one other exception on the screen. It was the consumer good. It was the ham sandwich. That's, that's not a capital good. That's something that we consume for our direct enjoyment. And that's what all of it was, was geared towards. That's what all of it was directed towards. One thing that we didn't mention but was very present in that schematic was that entrepreneurship uh, was the glue. Entrepreneurship was connecting all of these nodes. There were all... All of these people who were working for a business, the business had an owner. The business had somebody who was, who was taking a risk. They were, they were combining these factors of production, not knowing what the final outcome would be. But they're guessing that there's going to be some consumer who's going to want to, to purchase it. And we'll talk a lot about that uh, later on. Uh, we talked about how it's all directed at satisfying consumers. And my point that I want to make is that society is this division of labor. So this structure of production, this division of labor that, that goes into the production of all the goods that we consume, not just ham sandwiches, that is society. So society is the division of labor, and it represents peaceful cooperation on a massive scale. So if, you just, if we can see all of the cooperation that it takes to make just a ham sandwich, but then we multiply it for all of the, all of the consumer goods that we enjoy – then you start to realize just how magnificent all of this cooperation is, like how, how almost miraculous it is that we can all work together doing our tiny little bit of, of, the, of the production process for some consumer good somewhere. And it's all pointed towards the satisfaction of consumers. And so that's, that's, what, the, that's what the free market economy is. This is how I like to think about what, what the economy is and and really the beauty of it. There's, there's a beauty to the fact that all of these interconnected parts, it's very complex, but it's also a bunch of peaceful cooperation and it's all directed towards satisfying consumers. What's the result? So if we allow this process to work, if we allow entrepreneurs to produce, markets are allowed to flourish, then something amazing can happen. And, and we've seen it. We've seen snippets of it in our lifetime, but we've seen it especially over the past few centuries where there has been this explosion in standards of living, just an explosion in, in the types, quantities, and qualities of goods that we can enjoy. The fact that this room is, has central heating and air is something that would make the kings of old jealous. The, the variety of food that we all have access to is, is something that would just, that, that would make the kings of old, you know, send an army in to try to capture that for themselves. So, so don't take it for granted. That, that that's, could be one key takeaway from this talk, is don't take for granted the, the standards of living that we experience today and, and enjoy. 
And the way that you can not take it for granted is to appreciate the complexity and the peaceful co cooperation of, of the division of labor. We know that this has to do with markets because of the timing of it, but also we can see differences between regions, differences between countries in the world, and where this liftoff, this is, by the way, called the hockey stick of human prosperity, where the liftoff in uh, standards of living occurred and when they occurred, it had to do with markets being embraced. The, the idea of, of people uh, working for a business and an entrepreneur taking a risk and they themselves reaping the profits or incurring the losses as a result. So this, this whole thing is, is what makes our modern world what it is. And it's, it is society. Okay, so we define society. What about the Fed? What is the Fed? The Fed is the central bank of the United States. It's uh, tasked with regulating the banking system, doing monetary policy, and also being the bank for the U.S. government. Uh, Congress has given it a so-called dual mandate. It's got two things that it's supposed to do. Uh, and the, those two things are to maintain stable prices and to maximize employment, or at least maintain full employment is how that sometimes uh, is phrased. But one thing that I've noticed over its history, and we're coming up on its uh, 110th birthday, is that it has taken on some new operations, some new goals, some new things that it likes to do that are either outside of the bounds of what it was originally intended to do or outside of the bounds of, of its uh, congressional mandate. So when the Fed was founded, it was uh, supposed to stabilize the banking system. So people were sick and tired of all of these banking panics that were occurring during the 19th century. And so they, they said, well, if we have this central bank that can manage all of the increases and decreases in credit, all of the, uh, all of the banks that, have, that run out of their uh, reserves, and so they have to close their doors, if we can have some government, quasi-government institution that would, that would manage this for us, then we could, we could get rid of the banking panic problem. So that was its original intention. The idea was that an elastic currency, so if we can expand and contract the supply of currency with uh, the so-called needs of trade, then, then we could get rid of the banking panic problem. So that was the original intent. So they, they were tasked with stabilizing the banking system. They, the idea was uh, to, when I said the, the needs of trade, expanding and contracting the money supply with the needs of trade, that's what I mean by steering all economic activity with an elastic money supply. In uh, World War I and World War, World War II, they took on an additional role of financing war spending. So now another goal of, of the U.S. Federal Reserve is to finance government spending, especially when uh, the U.S. is going into war. In the, the 60s and 70s, the Fed was tasked with uh, maintaining the dollar status in international trade. And then the dual mandate came in, and that's the balance price inflation and unemployment point there. Uh, there were also, sometimes there's a third part to the dual mandate. So I guess it's a, I don't know, what's the three version of dual? Tri yeah, okay, a tri-mandate. So uh, sometimes they are also told to uh, make moderate long-term interest rates. So interest rates aren't going out of whack. Wouldn't that be nice? So uh, there, then we had in the 2008 crisis, they were tasked with bailing out the so-called too-big-to-fail financial institutions, or at least being a part of a, a cohort of agencies that were doing that. They were told to not uh, just regulate banks, but all financial institutions, and uh, to use its balance sheet to buy any kind of distressed asset. And this, I'm going to talk about this later on in the talk, how what the Fed is buying, what the Fed is doing has, has grown both uh, in size, but also in category, the sorts of stuff that, that it's doing. And then finally, as we've seen in the most recent crisis, another thing that the Fed does is it just supplies an unlimited amount of money. So if there's any sort of distress, distress in uh, financial markets, then the Fed will just dump as much money on it uh, to, to fix the problem. So this is, the reason I go through these things is just to show that the Fed is not, they're not constrained. They, they always cite their dual mandate. They always, uh, when they're given their uh, press conferences, like after the FOMC meets and the Fed chair is out there giving, its, uh, giving his, uh, he's basically just reading this press release, he, they're always citing the dual mandate. But my point to you is that the Fed has taken on a bunch of new roles over its history and many new roles just over the past um, you know, couple decades. So it's, it's not a bounded institution. It's not something that has any sort of uh, constraints on it. 
Okay, so where am I going to go with this? So government control over money and banking, which is what a central bank is and does, uh, is by itself an example of government overreach. So we can, we can see how money originates on the market, how banks can operate on the free market by, by being money warehouses or being financial intermediaries. And there's no need for the government to come in. There's no need for the government to manage money. There's no need for the government to manage banking. And so with the imposition of, of a uh, central bank, that goes, that goes away. So it is by itself an example of uh, government overreach. But it's also an enabling cause of the expanding size, scope, and power of the state through mainly through cost concealment. So we're, we're pretty familiar, familiar. If you've gone to any grocery store in the past three years, you're pretty familiar with rising prices, right? So this is, this is a form of cost concealment. The, in the old days, governments would raise money by sending tax collectors around, and they would ask for money at the point of a gun or some other weapon, right? And that's how they would collect their revenues. But now we, we have a system in which the government can raise its own revenues through a money printer. Now, they, they don't just, you know, the, the U.S. Treasurer doesn't just call up the Fed and say, hey, print me up a, a billion dollars for this program that Congress has approved. They do a little sort, a sort of a shell game where the government issues debt and then the debt is bought by financial institutions and then those financial institutions eventually sell it to the Fed, or at least a good portion of it. And when the Fed purchases the debt, the, they do it with brand new money. They do it with money that didn't exist before. So this is a way for the government to acquire resources. It's a way for the government to increase its revenues and spend as much as it wants to, even in excess of taxation, even in excess of what it can collect, collect from the income tax and other forms of taxes. So the government the government now is not bounded by taxes either. So since the Fed is not bounded in its money creation, the government is not bounded either because the government is able to benefit as a result of that. So and we talk about how democracy allows uh, the government to, to be subject to the will of the people. Well, another thing that allows the government to be subject to the will of the people is by it being constrained by how much it can collect in taxes. So what if, what if we told the government okay, fine, tax us, but you can only spend as much as you collect in taxes. But if the Fed and the uh, federal government are able to work together to print up new money and finance the government's activities with money printing, then that's a way for it to extract resources from us, from the private economy, without having to increase taxes. And you, you start to see why it's, that's sort of beneficial, why that, why that would be at least popular. Because nobody likes taxes, right? Nobody like taxes are very unpopular, but the effects of inflation are subtle and complex. They're hard to see, require some cause and effect thinking. And a lot of it is delayed as well. We're going to see how Fed manipulation of the money supply and credit uh, results in additional crises where the government can expand even more. So this is another effect of, of the Fed. That's called the ABCT there stands for Austrian business cycle theory. So this is a theory that a bus the business cycle is caused by artificial credit expansion, which happens from the Federal Reserve actions. And one other thing, if we had time, um, that we'll talk about is that there are some indirect and, and very pernicious effects of the Fed and inflation, especially on our culture and our psychology as well. So there, there are cultural and ideological changes that, that encourage the public's accept, acceptance of government intervention, but also... Also, we can see increased hedonism, decreased reliance on family and other uh, good private social institutions uh, where the government is taking the central role in managing our lives as opposed to us figuring out how, how to, to get along with each other and help each other and support each other in uh, sort of the old-fashioned way. Okay, so before we get into the nitty-gritty details of how the Fed does that, what's the alternative? Like, what if, what if we didn't have the Fed doing this sort of thing? What, what would a free market in money and banking look like? Well, there's uh, these two economists, Karl Menger and Ludwig von Mises, uh, who talked about where money comes from. And they said that money originates on the market. So money originates, like, like if you think about gold, th that sort of hard commodity money, that originates from people trying to overcome this double coincidence of wants problem in their exchanges. So if you think about a barter economy where we're trading goods for goods, then uh, it's, it would be difficult for me as an economics teacher 
to go grocery shopping, right? <laughs> because what that, what that would mean is I would have to go find a grocer who's willing to give me eggs and milk and all the sorts of things that my kids like to eat. And in exchange, I had to offer them economics lectures, right? Maybe at the cash register. So actually the location is not the hard part. The hard part would be finding a, a grocer, somebody who is willing to sit and listen to economics lectures in exchange for groceries, right? So this, that's called the double coincidence of wants problem. It would be really hard for me to find somebody who wants what I deliver, except for you find people here, right? Because you're here. You demonstrated a preference for this. <laughs> so um, what people realized that they could do in these barter economies is that they could go through an intermediary. They could go through a certain commodity, a commodity that is more saleable, uh, it's more liquid, uh, it's, it's something that a bunch of people like. And so instead of going from good to good, they go from good to good to good. So they use that middle good, that medium, as a bridge for them to get the sorts of good that they actually want. So, so what I could do is I could sell my economics lectures in exchange for gold, and then I could go take gold and, and take that to the grocery store to buy my groceries, right? It's, there's an extra step in the process, but it's much easier that way. It's, I don't have to go searching around the economy for me to, to find uh, somebody who's willing to accept the one thing that I produce. Instead, I can go through this medium of exchange. So the, the importance of this, it is important because there's, uh, there are some other theories about where money comes from. And some people say that money comes from the state. Money comes from the government deciding, uh, or the king says, this, this coin with my face on it is, is money. Or these pieces of paper with uh, nice Latin phrases on it and uh, old dead presidents on it. This is money, and this is what you have to use. But what Manger and Mises show is that that can't be the origins of money. Money cannot originate that way. And money has to originate on the market because people have to figure out a way to value it. People have to figure out a way to, to, to come up with prices for the things that they buy and the things that they sell. And if a king just sort of dumps a bunch of pieces of paper on the economy and says, hey, start using this as money, people don't have a system of prices. They don't have th this memory of, of what they bought and what they sold that would help them figure out, well, how much should I charge for X? How much should I charge for Y? How, what's a good price for me to buy this, this carton of eggs and so on? So, so the, that state or origin theory of money can't be true. It has to be the case that to the extent that the state is involved in money, they've co-opted something that was produced by the market. In a uh, private, unhampered, free market economy, uh, we can definitely think about banks acting as money warehouses and financial intermediaries. So banks offer a service. Uh, if we have gold as our money, uh, it might be sort of clunky to carry around these big gold coins in our pockets for our transactions. Um, and so what we might like instead is the ability to to transact these gold coins without having to carry them around. And so we can hire the services of this firm that specializes in keeping the gold safe, and then we can swipe a plastic card that gives instructions to the bank to, to, to send a certain amount of money from one bank to the, to the vendor's bank, right? So we can, we can certainly have a free market in that. Uh, but the point is, well, we won't get into that. They, they would have to charge a fee for this. So the... <coughs> The system that we operate uh, today is a fractional reserve banking system in which they're profiting off of the use of your money by lending it to other people. But in a private free market economy, there would have to be a fee charged for this sort of thing. But it would work just like uh, any other warehousing service. And we could still have financial intermediation where some people specialize in finding people who have savings and people who want to borrow so that they can buy a house or start a business or all sorts of things. The important thing is that in this sort of system, economic growth would be uh, caused by, the, the root cause of economic growth would be saving, capital accumulation, and entrepreneurship. So it would require us setting aside resources for production in order for production to ex expand. So in order for us to have more consumer goods, more ham sandwiches and burritos and whatnot, we first have to set aside resources you remember the ham sandwich schematic up there? First, we have to set aside those resources for their use in production before we can produce anything, right? So saving has, has to occur. And that saving has to be channeled into the production of capital goods. So we have to accumulate and use capital for production. And we have to allow entrepreneurs to do their work. We have to allow entrepreneurs to connect the dots and say, 
I, I think consumers are going to be willing to spend X amount in year two of this project. So I'm going to put some money down today so that, uh, so that that can happen. So all of that has to occur for economic growth. If we had this sort of monetary system, this free market monetary system, we would probably see stable deflation. So in, under the gold standard, it was like pretty consistently 1% to 2% deflation as opposed to what the Fed says they target these days, which is 2% inflation. So, and we'll talk a little bit about how does that work or how would that influence what consumers are doing. So people would save with money. They wouldn't have to save by risking their wealth in retirement accounts that are connected to the stock market, which goes up and down all the time. People would be able to save money and they would be able to rely on that money actually increasing in purchasing power over time if prices in general are decreasing. Loan markets would reflect time preference. So loan markets and the availability of credit would reflect people's willingness to save as opposed to the whims of the central bankers. And production would only be able to extend in length based on the availability of resources. So if we want to pursue bigger projects, more longer term projects, then we, we would be able to do that, but only if the supply of savings is there. Only if consumers have actually said, hey, we are willing to wait longer for our consumer goods. We're going to set aside resources today for production. Okay, so that's the alternative view. I wanted to make sure that I, I didn't get out of here and uh, without giving you this sort of alternative view of what, what the monetary system could look like without a central bank. So I've stuck this in right here. But what is the, what is the Fed like today? So it was back, back a not the alternative, but what do we have today? So this is a, a, a great uh, illustration of uh, Andrew Jackson doing battle with the Second Bank of the United States. And what's interesting is that the uh, political cartoonist, his name was Henry Robinson, I think, uh, he was actually against Jackson. And he was in favor of the central bank. So he was against Jackson uh, when he was drawing this. And yet he was trying to lampoon Jackson's battle against the central bank. And I, I guess the idea was he was trying to say that um, it's sort of uh, futile for Jackson to do this. Like he's definitely going to lose. But if he's trying to get, if he's trying to get the public on his side in favor of a central bank, I don't think I would have drawn it as a monster, as this many-headed hydra. And this is this is how I view the the central bank today. I, I think that it's expanded uh, role, all the new powers that it's taken on all the new things that it's doing, uh, which, by the way, are not approved by Congress, even though the Fed is a creature of Congress, uh, the Fed claims independence. And so it can, it can choose a new inflation target without it being approved by Congress. It can, it can uh, do all sorts of things. It can it, buy billions of dollars of uh, mortgage-backed securities, and uh, none of that has to be run through, the, through uh, the, the people's house. None of it has to go through Congress. So the Fed is, is, has grown to monstrous proportions. That's, that's the point here. And I mentioned earlier that the Fed has changed a lot recently. So here's what happened in 2008. So this is the, the Fed's total assets. This is all of the stuff that, that the Fed purchases and, and keeps on its uh, balance sheet. And you'll notice that in uh, 2008, late 2008, uh, the Fed's balance sheet just exploded where nobody could see this coming. Nobody knew that the Fed would do this. Nobody knew that the Fed could do this sort of thing. So this was a brand new thing for the Fed to do, for it, for its balance sheet to explode by, uh, it was the trillions of dollars, billions, trillions. What does it matter anymore? Billions, trillions, quadrillions. But so this was a brand new thing that, that sort of took the market uh, by surprise. Uh, people, didn't, people didn't know what to expect. People didn't know what would happen as a result of this massive increase in its, in its balance sheet. But now, so this is from 2008 until present day, now these explosions in the Fed's balance sheet are just par for the course. Now it's just a part of our normal everyday expectation of, of what the Fed might do, especially in a crisis. So you'll notice that there were huge increases in, in, its, in its assets, in the, the stuff that it owns in uh, 2020, in 2009. And you can see the other... They call it quantitative easing, all the other increases in its assets. So in the past, the, the assets that the Fed would purchase were government bonds. It would, it would only purchase government debt. But 
another new thing that the Fed has started doing is that it's it's purchasing a rainbow of assets. It's buying all sorts of things. Notably, in the in the 2008 crisis, it started purchasing mortgage-backed securities. So now it's not just buying public debt; it's buying private assets. It's it's getting involved in private markets and influencing uh, real estate markets as well. So it's it's got all sorts of things these days. <clears throat> Again, the the main point that I'm trying to make is that the Fed is a monster. That the Fed is is like this shape shifting monster that nobody can expect what it will do, and this is evidence that I think shows that the Fed is not bounded. There's no uh, there's no limiting principle for the Fed. There's there's no uh, there's no uh, there's no authority that can tell the Fed you shouldn't have you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have increased your uh, total assets by that amount. You shouldn't have. Uh, uh, started buying mortgage-backed securities. You shouldn't have started lending to maiden lane uh, corporations. You shouldn't have participated in the bailouts. There's no authority that, that's doing that sort of thing. The Fed is just sort of operating on its own. Another brand new thing that the Fed is doing is losing. <laughs> the, this is a, a graph of the Fed's remittances to the Treasury. So in, a, in normal times, the Fed earns some positive interest spread. So it's got a bunch of stuff in its assets. It's got some stuff in its liabilities. And usually it earns some interest. And it pays for its army of PhD economists that work for the Fed. And then it sends the rest as a remittance, a remittance to the Treasury. And so this is a part of the fact that it's like this quasi-private slash uh, public institution. But anything that it has extra by, by earning interest from mortgage-backed securities or Treasury debt it actually gives back to the treasury until this year. <laughs> so you'll notice this like an upside down hockey stick, right? This is the hockey stick of depression, <laughs> the hockey stick of, whoa. Um, so this is, this is new. This is strange. But people don't really know what to expect. People don't really know how to respond to the Fed losing all of this money. And the way that this has happened is that it, I showed you the graph of it increasing its assets. A lot of the stuff that it was purchasing it purchased when interest rates were low. So it, it bought a bunch of mortgages where, when interest rates were around like 2 to 3%. And it bought a bunch of treasury debt, a bunch of government bonds when interest rates were low. But now interest rates are high. And so it, the, li the liabilities that it has are paying those high interest rates. So it has to pay interest on reserves to the member banks. Um, and it's got it's to do what it can to, to increase interest rates through um, other operations that it does. And what that means is it's paying this much and receiving this much. And so it's incurring huge losses that nobody has ever seen before. Once again, it's something that nobody knew would happen or even could happen, and yet it's happening to the Fed. Okay, so another thing about the Fed is that everybody's paying attention to it now. Uh, if you aren't, then you're lucky because it's, uh, it's a circus. Everybody's watching the Fed when it's doing these press conferences. You can, it's almost like, uh, like college football, kind of, because the, the news media will do like play-by-plays of when, when Jerome Powell is just sort of like monotone reading his script up there, and they're like paying attention to the pauses or paying attention to like there was this one slight textual change from the previous announcement to this one. What could that mean? It's like, like wow. I think there's a little bit too much attention being paid um, in these announcements. Uh, here's one of the funny examples was somebody commented on the color of his tie. So it's all over. The U.S. economy is in the dumps because his tie is great. But the, but the reason why people are paying attention is because the stakes are so high. So the Fed is a powerful institution, and what it does to interest rates and what it does to the money supply affect every corner of the economy. And so that's why people are paying attention to it. One thing that people look at is the Fed's projections. They look at, they look at the FOMC. FOMC, by the way, stands for Federal Open Market Committee. That's the main monetary policy making arm of the, of the Federal Reserve. They issue what's called the Summary of Economic Projections, the SEP. So the FOMC does the SEP. I'll give you a quiz on all this later. <laughs> Uh, and what they do is they give a forecast for what they think GDP will be in a few quarters, what will the unemployment rate be in a few quarters, what will CPI be in a few quarters, what, what will the Fed's own interest rate be? So the Fed 
sets a target for the federal funds rate, and, and the FOMC gives a projection of what they think their own policy interest rate will be. And what's really funny is they're often wrong. And that's what this graph shows. So this graph shows their projections of the dashed lines for all the different quarters where they made the projections. And then the solid black line shows what the federal funds rate actually was in that time period where they, where they projected it. So you'll notice that they were, they were way caught off guard by the, the 2020 crisis. And they were way caught off guard by the extent of price inflation and how much they would raise interest rates um, in 2022 and, and also this year. So the Fed is not very good at even guessing what it will do in the future, and yet everybody's uh, paying attention to it. Okay, so we've sort of got a glimpse of what the Fed does and how bad it is at some things. It is good at one thing. Uh, I've thought about this a lot. It's really good at financing government debt. So the if you've looked at federal debt lately, it's just exploding and CBO projections, which are usually pretty good, showed that interest payments on the debt are just going to be huge in the future. One thing that the Fed is very good at is, is giving money to the government. But let's, let's put all this into perspective. So Henry Hazlitt, who uh, wrote Economics in One Lesson, I highly recommend that you read it. He said that the art of economics consists in looking not merely at the immediate, but at the longer effects of any act or policy. It consists in tracing the consequences of that policy not merely for one group, but for all groups. So, um, I'm missing a slide here. Oh, it's just out of place. Sorry. So, here's, here's my slide where I'm listing some of the, the long-run effects and the effects on all groups. So, what, what sort of things is the Fed doing? Um, so, one thing that it's definitely causing is inflation. So, it's expanding the money supply and it's causing the increase in prices and, and all, of the, all of the problems that we see that are associated with that. One thing uh, with inflation is that it really discourages saving. So you remember I mentioned that saving is a prerequisite for economic growth. In order for us to produce more, we have to set aside resources for production. But if nobody has an incentive to save because prices keep increasing and increasing, and so my, my goal is to just consume as much as I can now, well, then I, I'm not going to want to save. I'm just going to want to consume as much as, as I can. And so production is going to be hampered as a result. There's less capital accumulation as well. With inflation, we have uninhibited growth of government. So like I said, the Fed is really good at financing uh, government debts. Uh, we have widespread indebtedness, not just with the government, but the, the public at large, uh, businesses and consumers become highly indebted. So if prices are increasing, then not only do I not have an incentive to save, but I have an incentive to borrow. Because if I can borrow today and then pay my debts in the future when the dollar is worth less, then those future payments are worth less than they would than my perspective of them today, right? So if prices are increasing, I would rather pay off my debts with a money that has a lower purchasing power in the future. So this inflation that's caused by the Fed is it's causing widespread indebtedness. We have way more uh, debt than we otherwise would without it. And with that comes financialization. So a lot of people talk bad about the financial sector and how much it's grown over the past few years. And I think there's something to that. Um, like I'm, I'm as capitalist as they come, but I do think that there's something to be said about the way that there's this whole, this massive multiple trillion dollar sector of the economy that's just moving paper around, that they're just uh, slicing and dicing debt they're combining it and recombining it in different ways and, and packaging it in different ways. Uh, and that's, that's what the whole sector does. Now, don't, don't hear me say I'm not poo-pooing on finance. I'm not poo-pooing on, on uh, financial intermediation. I think that there's a very important role for that. I just I think that there's way more of the paper pushing and, and the financialization than uh, we would have if we didn't have the Fed. We also have exacerbated inequality. So when the Fed prints new money, when we have new money into our economy, it comes in at a particular point. So somebody has to, has to be the first spender. And usually that first spender is the government or somebody closely connected to the government, right? And by the way, this is why people try to counterfeit. It's like the, the reason why counterfeiting is attractive is because it gives you purchasing power that other people don't have. If by the act of creating new units of money, you actually cause all prices to rise proportionally with the 
money printing that you did, then it wouldn't, there would be no payoff. There would be no reason to, to printing the new money. But that's not what happens. What happens is the money is printed, somebody spends it, and in the process of the money trickling through the economy, people increase their demands for goods and services broadly, and that's what causes prices to rise in a step-by-step -step fashion. So if you think this through, what this means is that there's one group that benefits. There's one group whose incomes rise. The prices of the things that they sell rise before uh, other people, other people's incomes rise. And so their, their selling prices rise before their buying prices rise, which means that they're able to benefit as a result of the inflation. But then there's this other group, perhaps they're on a fixed income um, or they're just, you know, on, on the uh, outskirts of the economy because the money just takes longer to get to them, they have to start paying these higher prices before their incomes increase. And so what we see is a shifting of wealth and incomes towards the money printer. So wealth goes towards the money, the money printer, where, the source of the money in the economy. And I, and I think this exacerbates uh, wealth and, and income inequality. I, I'm, I'm sure of it that, it, that it does that. This, uh, that process that I just described, by the way, is called Cantillon effects. So if you're interested in that, you could look it up. So the fact that money comes into the economy through one particular point means that other, some people benefit and other people um, are harmed. It must be true because if it weren't true, then there would be no reason to issue new money. So if the first spenders of money were not able to extract resources from others or from any other corner of the economy, then they wouldn't, they wouldn't do it in the first place. So we have exacerbated inequality. We had the boom-bust cycle, uh, which I'll get to in, in just one moment. Yeah, we don't have time. We also have distracted entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are supposed to be thinking about what consumers want. They're supposed to be thinking about how to combine factors of production today under conditions of uncertainty. Uh, and one very important part of uncertainty is I'm not sure what consumers are going to want in the future. They have to do this, and it takes focus. It takes uh, dedication. It takes uh, discipline to do that. To the extent that their attention is diverted towards the Fed because there's so much on the line with what interest rates will be the next quarter or some other question like that, it means that they're, they're focusing on something that's not productive. They're, they're focusing on something that's, that's not the consumer. So you remember the gray tie. That's the sort of thing that I'm talking about. All right, so those are, I would categorize those things as economic consequences, but there are also some cultural and social and psychological consequences of, of what the Fed does. So we have higher rates of time preference. So there's way more living for today. I got to spend as much as I can now because I don't have an incentive to save. Uh, prices are increasing. Therefore, I'm going to buy what I can now before prices increase. So we have higher rates of time preference where people are consuming more and saving less. And of course, this, this encourages or goes along with a, a lifestyle of hedonism where uh, people are just you know, living for today. We also have, because of the Cantillon effects that I mentioned before, intergenerational and class conflicts. So if, if we can all agree that exacerbated income and wealth inequality is not very good for social cohesion, then what that means is what the Fed is doing is causing more of the conflicts between generations. Um, I think we're seeing a lot of that today in the, the housing market, especially. So there's all sorts of headlines where because interest rates are so high, it's mainly the older generation that's, that's being able to uh, pay cash for houses. And, and a lot of the people in younger generations are upset about this because it's harder for them to get into their, into their first home. One major point that I, I don't think there's enough discussion about this is that when we have less savings, and more indebtedness, it means that people are more vulnerable in crises. So there's less saving and future preparedness where people don't have, they don't have that emergency fund set aside for when they lose their job in a recession, or they, they might not even have uh, the, the family or other uh, social network that would protect them in, in some sort of uh, personal crisis. And so when we have a huge economic crisis that hits the whole country, it means that we have a bunch of people who are not ready. A bunch of people who are hit with this crisis and they have to look around, oh, who's going to bail me out? Who's going to protect me? Who's going to rescue us from this catastrophe? Because I, I can't do it by myself. Me and my family, we can't protect ourselves because we've never, we haven't had the incentive to save. We haven't had 
uh, we haven't had this the free market monetary system that would prepare me for these sorts of, of hiccups or larger than hiccups. And so I think this leads people to depend on the government. I think people look to the government. They see that the government has already expanded in size and scope because of the monetary interventions before. And they're also left less prepared for the crises when they come because of those monetary interventions. And so it's a perfect storm. It's like now the crisis is here. The government already has the scope. They already have the power. uh, And I don't have the ability to rescue myself or people around me. Therefore, I'm going to look to the government for help. And so I'm going to petition my uh, my politician. I'm going to uh, petition my representative to, to vote for this act or for this stimulus package or, or what, what have you, some other sort of government intervention. So I think we have a cycle of, a cycle of interventions that lead to more expansions of government power. And the crises themselves that, that precipitate it are caused by the expansions of government power in the first place. It's it's not, not a happy talk, is it? <laughs> like this downward spiral of shame and woe. We also have debt slavery. So if we don't have savings, if we're not setting aside uh, uh, money for the future and, and where we have this uh, future uh, preparedness, uh, it means that we go into debt. It means that we're purchasing all these consumer goods. Uh, we're purchasing houses uh, with very long-term mortgages. Um, and it means that we don't have the wherewithal to, to decide where to live, or at least it's not as easy for us to, to get up and move when there's a new job offer. Uh, it makes us uh, less able to make these sorts of decisions for ourselves and for our families when an opportunity arises or when a crisis comes. So if, uh, if you get uh, fired from your job, but you have this mortgage because we had this indebted society, then it's harder, it's harder for you to to keep going. You've got to find some job, any job, as opposed to one that would suit your interests and suit your skills. And so this is what I mean by debt slavery. There was a recent talk by uh, George Guido Holzman uh, where he went through this. And uh, if you're interested in that topic, I I can uh, send that uh, video to you or show you where it is online. Finally, I'll mention that uh, government crowds out uh, private charity. So if we have this expanding scope of government because of all these monetary interventions, it means that um, it means that there's less room for families to work together. There's less there's less reason for neighborhoods to to have each other have each other's backs. Uh, so like when something happens, um, instead of looking to my neighbor uh, for help or looking to my family for help, I'm looking at the government for help. And I think there's a lot of government crowding out of that sort of thing. And so we just get this all powerful state that's making all of these decisions for us. They're the ones who are going to bail everybody out. Um, and I think it comes at, a, at a, a huge loss of liberty. Okay, I wasn't going to go th- through the details of the boom-bust cycle, but I wanted there to be just a little bit of time for, for Q&A. So I'll stop right here. I'll put some further reading on the... Uh, there it is. Oop, I went too fast. Further reading on the slide for you to check out. And we'll do some Q&A. There we go. There we go. Oh, now it's backwards. Oh, well, it'll work. (laughs) Thank you all, by the way, so much for attending my lecture. Yeah. I think you responded to Uh, to government uh, subsidies to farmers and how it quote unquote helps them when like they have a bad year or something like that. Like are, are subsidies to farmers good or are they bad? So the, the question was, the, are subsidies to farmers good or bad? And my, my answer is bad. I, I think that that's, that's a good example of government crowding out something that should be and could be offered by the free market. And one very uh, plausible institution for that would be insurance. So if there's a, if some farmer wanted to be able to insure himself against some weather catastrophe or something else, uh, then I think that they, they could purchase an insurance policy that would that would have that sort of provision where if there's a bad year or some some sort of weather event like a tornado that wipes out their crops, then I think that's what that's what insurance is for. It's it's not it's not the role of government to protect farmers or really any any business. 
uh, if there's like one particular season or one particular time period where something bad happens. Yeah. Good question. Any other questions? Um, do you think 2008 was the catalyst for the government expanding, specifically the Fed? I, I think it was a – so the question was, uh, do you think uh, 2008 was a major catalyst for the expansion of the Fed and the government? And I think it was huge. I, I definitely think that um, that the, the Fed became a new animal in the Great Recession and the financial crisis of 2008. And I think you can clearly see that in the graphs that I put up. So you can see that's where we had the first major – uh, explosion in the Fed's balance sheet. That's where we had the first major change in what the Fed was purchasing. It was no longer just government debt, but now uh, mortgage-backed securities and other things. That was where we first saw uh, the government uh, stepping in in an economic crisis and bailing out uh, financial institutions. So I, I, I think there were a bunch of brand new things that happened in 2008, and I think that that set the precedent for further expansions by the Fed and the federal government and other agencies uh, to expand in other crises. And I, I think we're seeing that today. I think we're just seeing this sort of um, snowball effect of intervention on top of intervention. And I think a lot of it got started with, with what happened in 2008. I will mention, however, that if you look at the Fed's overall history, not just since 2008, but since uh, 1913 when it got started, it ha it has always been growing in size and scope. It has always been grabbing new powers, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, um, throughout its entire life. It's just that there are some really glaring examples of that um, in recent times since 2008. That's a great question. Um, so now that the Fed is purchasing uh, mortgage-backed securities, do you think that that has an influence in the increase of uh, the housing of like the real estate and housing market? Oh, uh, definitely. So the question was, uh, now that the Fed is purchasing mortgage-backed securities, does that ha have an effect in, on real estate and the housing market? And I, I definitely think so. Um, I think um, a lot of the attention that people give to the Fed these days is because they are thinking about their mortgage. They're thinking about buying homes and, and real estate. Uh, in fact, one of the headlines in, in uh, the Wall Street Journal yesterday was – was all about how commercial real estate is in trouble because of the changes in, in interest rates. So I think a lot of what the Fed does, uh, especially since the 2008 crisis, uh, is affecting real estate, not just residential real estate, but commercial real estate. And I think the reason for that is because the type of, of bubble that, that popped in 2008, and it was a housing bubble. So since it was a bunch of... Uh, mortgage-backed securities that the entire financial sector deemed toxic uh, and the Fed decided to buy them, it was like a game of hot potato. So like this financial institution didn't want the mortgage-backed securities because they, they thought that they were going to tank in value, so they would so sell it to this financial institution. But that, they decided they didn't want it because they thought it was going to tank in value. And so the, the Fed was like the person in the room that raised their hands like, I'll take the hot potato. I'll take the I'll take the, the thing that's going to tank in value because I have, a, I have a black hole for a balance sheet. I have a money printer behind me, so I can take the hit. Um, and so I think that because the Fed did that, now they have a very outsized influence on, on real estate and, and the housing market today. Absolutely. Last question, I think. Um, if you were to speculate, what do you think the future will hold with the Fed now having losses? That, that's the trillion dollar question. So the question was, um, um, what's going to happen now that the Fed is incurring losses, right? Um, I, I don't know. No, nobody knows. So I'm not, I'm not just the only one who, who doesn't know. But I, I can think, I can speculate that there could be some political ramifications for the Fed. If you think about uh, where Congress has been going lately, it's, it's become very vitriolic, uh, but there is uh, one, um, there, there's a group of people in Congress who actually do care about fiscal restraint on the part of the federal government. And I think that they are in a prime position to put the Fed in the spotlight because now the Fed is costing the taxpayer directly, not just indirectly through inflation and the Cantillon effects that I talked about, 
So it's not it's not just the prices that you pay at the grocery store, but now that the Fed is incurring these losses, it is now directly impacting the um, the federal budget. It's directly impacting taxpayers. And so since that's what Congress is there for, Congress has the uh, has the purse strings. There's they have the power of the purse. I think that people in Congress could step up and they could they could really grill the Fed um, and say, well. You're incurring all these losses. Uh, you're supposedly privately owned by all these member banks. Why aren't you making them pay up for all of these losses? Why, why are you instead putting it on the Treasury? And so I think, I'm not sure what would happen as a result of that, but you could see some pretty um, dramatic changes in the structure of the Fed if that were to occur. They, they could lose some of their quasi-independence that they have, um, if the Congress decides to step up and say, hey, you're losing all this money and it's taxpayer money, you're going to have to start to uh, run stuff by me. Like you're going to have to uh, meet before Congress before you change the inflation target from 2% to something else. Um, or you're going to have to uh, uh, go before Congress before you decide to purchase, you know, over $100 billion worth of XYZ. So I think that, that's what I'm speculating. Um, I know that's sort of like big picture, but that's that's the best I could say. All right, well, thank you so much for having me. I, I really enjoyed being here. So quickly, uh, so I want to announce, uh, so we have uh, three events uh, tomorrow uh, with Dr. Newman. Uh, so the first, at 10 o'clock, he's going to be doing a research presentation uh, looking at uh, at hyperinflation and the societal impacts of that. So that's at, in uh, Student Union 297. So all, all three events will be in uh, Student Union 297. Uh, so the first is the research presentation on hyperinflation at 10. At 11.30 uh, to 12.45, uh, we'll have a small group discussion, uh, which will basically be uh, an open-ended discussion on topics related to uh, tonight's uh, talk or, or anything else that you might want to ask uh, Dr. Newman. Then at, uh, at 1 o'clock, uh, also in Student Union 297, we're going to have a directed discussion on, on this little book, which is the second one in the reading list up there, uh, What Has Government Done to Our Money? Uh, and we have uh, a dozen or so copies of that uh, here, if you're interested. You can take one with you and show up at... Uh, at 1 o'clock tomorrow in Union 297. Thank you for coming.